Hi, everyone. I'm Ed Baker. I'm your host, producer at the Addiction Recovery Channel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I couldn't be happier than to have our uh, uh, guest uh, join us today. Our guest today is Dr. John Kelly. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, Ed. Great to be here with you. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Yes, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Kelly is a licensed clinical psychologist actively working with individuals and families with alcohol and other drug use disorders. He is the Elizabeth R. Spalin Professor of Psychiatry in the field of addiction medicine at Harvard Medical School. He enjoys the distinction of being the first endowed professor in addiction medicine at Harvard. Uh, Dr. Kelly is uh, prolific. He's uh, published more than 200 peer-reviewed articles, reviews, and contributions uh, to books focused in the field of addiction science. Um, I could go on forever, but I'll just cite a few more of his uh, impressive accomplishments. He has served as a consultant um, to the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. He served as a consultant to the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Kelly, thank you so much uh, for being on the show today. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. You know, we were chatting a little bit before we went on, on air and I was telling you that um, my, 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 my introduction to you, my, my my, my familiarity with your work basically revolves around your research into stigma uh, and language. And, uh, and I, would like, I would like to begin there. I'd like you perhaps to um, review your work or summarize your work. I think our audience would benefit greatly from hearing uh, about your work from you. Mm -hmm. Sure, Ed, thank you. Yeah, you know, this is a, a topic of course that Whenever we're talking about addiction and substance use disorders, we are talking also about stigma and discrimination because those unfortunately uh, go together. Um, and there are many reasons for that. I can talk about uh, some of those reasons why that is the case. Um, um, but uh, I became interested particularly, I wasn't necessarily interested in stigma per se as a, as a uh, you know, scientific pursuit in studying stigma when I got into the field. I was more interested in, you know, helping people with addiction and, and the families and studying things like treatment and, and recovery support services and mechanisms of behavior change through which people recover. Um, but I got into this area around about the early 2000s where this term abuse in particular began to concern me. And I began to think, well, you know, if you call someone a, an abuser, it's kind of like, like a child abuser. Mm. Um, you're kind of implying that they're kind of engaging in willful misconduct. And I wonder what the implications of that are. You know, in, in, in DSM-4, some of viewers may remember DSM-4 or know about DSM-4 and the prior iterations of our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, which included the term abuse, because there were two categories, um, of, of, a, of a substance problem, if you will. One was called substance abuse, the other one was called substance dependence. Uh, and the abuse therefore terminology was really perpetuating this idea uh, potentially that people that had these problems that suffered from these disorders were actually engaging in willful misconduct. So, so then I, I, I designed a study to test that out and I randomly assigned, you know, um, a vignette to about 700 clinicians. Um, these were doctoral level clinicians to see if when they were exposed to someone with a, a drug problem, if they were described as being a substance abuser versus being described as having a substance use disorder. Otherwise the description was the same. Um, and you randomly assign those two terms describing the same person would there be differential judgments placed on that person based on just on that terminology difference? And in fact, we found, yes, there were, even among highly trained professionals, um, they were systematically biased by exposure to that abuse terminology. 
So that opened my eyes, and I think many other people's eyes. This was back in 2010, we published that. We did a follow-up study, similar study with the general public, found even bigger magnitude differences, whereby the abuse terminology seemed to induce these negative, more punitive biases against people with drug and alcohol problems relative to calling them uh, as having this, you know, referring to them as having a substance use disorder. Yeah, that's fascinating. The, uh, the 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 power of language, uh, both uh, yeah. has negative effects and also positive effects. But your your paper of two thousand nineteen, the real stigma of substance use disorders, you summarize the effects nicely. It's uh, there's basically five bullets. The person described as a substance abuser was perceived as less likely to benefit from treatment and more likely to benefit from punishment, mm -hmm. how much more clear mm -hmm. can it be? Mm -hmm. The person uh, described as a substance abuser was perceived as more likely to be socially threatening. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are your findings and they're profound. Mm -hmm. The person uh, perceived as a substance abuser was found to be more likely to be blamed mm -hmm. for the symptoms associated with their disorder and more likely to be perceived as being in control. In other words, well, you know, I can just stop doing this whenever I feel like it. So that element of, of choice enters into the picture. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? The, the importance of this element of people being perceived as willfully engaging in the behaviors associated with addiction. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this kind of pertains to why it is that substance use disorders are so stigmatized as I began to talk about right at the beginning of this show today. Um, and I think it has to do with these two, two factors, cause and controllability. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this pertains to choice because sometimes people, and I think you know, even relative to other psychiatric illnesses, substance use disorder is more stigmatized because people view it as people taking something outside of themselves, taking it into their body, that involves an initial choice uh, to do that. Uh, and so you can see why then people will say, well, they're just engaging in selfish, willful misconduct at the expense of other people. Now, the, the thing is with cause and controllability, we know now from 50 years of studies on the etiology of addiction over the last 50 years, We've learned a ton about genetics and the genetic contribution to addiction. We know now, for example, that roughly half the risk of addiction is conferred by genetics. Um, and this pertains to cause, one of the dimensions that underlies stigma. Mm -hmm. Because if we, say to, if we say about a condition that somebody has, the stigmatized, that you know, it's not their fault and they can't help it, stigma tends to go down. If we say it is their fault and really they can help it, then stigma tends to go up. And so we know with gen the genetic contribution that just like other complex illnesses to which we may be susceptible, addiction is no different <clears throat> in that we have a genetic, some of us have a genetic predisposition which places us at higher elevated risk for contracting uh, the disorder of uh, addiction. Mm. And that manifests in different metabolism and different reward um, salience on, ex on initial exposure. Take a drug like alcohol, 90% roughly of the population is exposed to alcohol, but only about 20% of people in their lifetime will mm. encounter a problem with alcohol. Mm. Um, now that's just by virtue. Some of us are protected, some of us are more vulnerable by virtue of our genetics. Mm. Related to controllability, so in other words, you know, we don't know, people don't know they're getting into that high risk area because they don't know they're different from other people when they're exposed to the drug initially. Mm. Whether that be illicit drug like alcohol or an illicit drug like opioid or heroin. Uh, people don't know that they're, they're experiencing a more profound effect from the, this exposure, but they do know that they like it and they want to repeat it. Mm. But they don't realize that they're different. They don't realize, nobody, as they say, ever plans on becoming addicted. That is something that you know, nobody ever in a million years thinks it's gonna to happen to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing um, is this, which you began to talk about, Ed, um, is the controllability aspect, the choice aspect. 
And this is another dimension, the second dimension that pertains to, to stigma, because this issue of controllability uh, implies, and again, this is where the abuser term, I think, has more relevance, is that people are choosing to, to engage in it. Therefore, they can turn it on and turn it off. It's not a compulsion. It's not something that's beyond their control. They're just engaging in selfish behavior. Um, and we know now, again, from the last 30 years of neuroscience, that the neurocircuits in the brain are radically affected functionally and structurally. Let me show you an image. If yes, I can. thank you. Thank you. Um, to share the screen here for a second. And hopefully you can all see this. Um, but, you know, one of the wonderful things that we've learned, thanks to the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, part of the National Institutes of Health in the United States, through the funded research that's emanated from these institutes in the last 30 years, we understand now these neurocircuits, which are implicated in addiction, which pertain to the subcortical areas of reward and memory, right around here, these subcortical deep areas in the brain, which are older areas of the brain, and reward, motivation, uh, impulse control, and judgment up here in the prefrontal cortex, which are associated with decision making and inhibitory control, regulating the impulse to engage in a certain behavior. Now, what happens in addiction is that the, all these circuits, um, which are strongly related to reward and reinforcement are impaired. They're impaired, they become increasingly impaired over time, not just functionally, but also structurally. And you can see on the bottom right here, here's someone with alcohol addiction. And if you compare that to the brain on the left, someone who's a moderate drinker, you can see a radical difference in not just the function, but the structure of the brain is radically different. It's has this ventricular enlargement and the cortical shrinkage associated, typically associated with alcohol exposure. Now this produces toxic effects in the brain. It kills brain cells and also structurally changes the brain um, in radical ways. Now the good news is, here's the good news. The bad news is, is, is what you can see on the screen. The good news is, is that a lot of that uh, damage to the brain can be repaired Mother Nature can do a job when people abstain and get into recovery. There's a lot of brain recovery um, mm -hmm. as well. And the brain, Mother Nature can and do her work to bring the, bang, the brain back to life. Now, it might not be the same mm -hmm. level of um, speed of processing that was there before. Um, so instead of you know using the I-95 to get from A to B, you might have to use the side roads. Mm -hmm. um, but Mother Nature mm -hmm. does a job in helping us all get there uh, when we get into recovery. So the brain does change and does um, uh, recalibrate and repair itself in different ways. But you can see uh, quite clearly, and this has been one of the advantages um, of the latest science the last 30 years, that we understand now much more about this impaired control and we understand it now in the neurocircuitry and that can identify that. That is why this is a psychiatric illness. If that was not the case, if it was just a matter of choice, people are just choosing to do it, then punishment would work. Mm -hmm. Punishment mm -hmm. would work to change behavior and people would ex elicit control over the behavior and, and, and uh, kind of get on, get on the wagon as it were. Um, but we know that punishment does not work uh, to treat these conditions, whereas treatment does. Well, th thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for that clear explanation of what happens in the human brain when it's been exposed to toxic chemicals over a period of time. You know, uh, people, people have, um, I think it's difficult for people to understand a choice because people who develop addiction do choose to self-administer drugs but they don't choose to self-administer drugs with the intent of becoming addicted. They choose to self-administer drugs for many, many reasons. It could be self-esteem, it could be um, depression, it could be anxiety, it could be post-traumatic stress, it could be to fit in, it could be because of availability or social determinants, you know, poverty and isolation. It could be any one of a number of reasons. There are lots of reasons for choosing to self-administer drugs. But what happens over the course of the process is under the surface, the brain is being affected and people are unaware of that. And I think that um, 
the American Society of Addiction Medicine in 2019 clarified this idea of addiction and, and when it occurs. The word is kind of thrown around, I think a little bit inappropriately. Someone with a mild substance use disorder is not addicted. Um, the ASAM clarified that a little bit. I think they located it around the end of moderate beginning of severe substance use disorder. So by that time, the brain, as you so eloquently portrayed, has adapted to the presence of drugs, it operates with the presence of drugs, and it can operate without the presence of drugs. That's addiction proper, where, as you have said, there is no choice then. It's simply a, a, an incentive salience or a very powerful drive. Is that correct, doctor? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that you know, in, in maybe very rare instances, there is no choice, very rarely. Now, what there is, is radically impaired decision-making and inhibitory control. It doesn't mean that they can never make the decision to not use the drug and follow through with it. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they can, but they cannot do it consistently or for very long. So they can't hold on for very long without extra support and help. Um, so I would describe it as it's not impossible, but it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult um, for people to not use when the locomotive is like a locomotive of, of, of uh, energy that is pushing all the time um, in that direction towards drug use. So the tr people are trying to put the brakes on to slow down that locomotive. But because the way the brain works, and you, you said it, you know, the neuroadaptations and the automation that the brain does with powerful reinforcers, and again, this is genetically modulated. Don't forget, it's not just a function of neuroadaptation and neurotoxicity, but for certain people, there's a much deeper level whereby they are much more susceptible at the same level of, of exposure than somebody who does not have that genetic uh, predisposition. Um, so there's all these forces um, kind of converging. And then if you add to that, as you pointed out, Ed, other kinds of developmental environmental stresses, mm -hmm. including early exposure to the mm -hmm. drugs during teenage years, mm -hmm. these all amplify the risk. Um, and so if you come from an impoverished environment, if you suffer abuse as a child or neglect as a child, um, that affects your brain neurocircuitry and brain chemistry, uh, which sets people up um, for that more positive relief that they get on exposure to these substances than other people do who have a more enriched environment. They don't experience no. that level of reward. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kelly. And, and with that in mind, it, it, it couldn't be any more clear how, how important supports are for people with substance use disorder. Recovery supports, environmental supports, financial supports, transportation, housing, education, the kinds of supports that, that people need to establish safety while, while the brain heals. You, I think you've alluded to that. It's a healing process and it takes time. Now, people, I think Nora Volkov, the director of the National Institutes on, on Drug Use, I think uh, Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General under um, Obama, I think you worked with Surgeon General Murthy on his facing addiction in America. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, uh, pe people, noted people, are, and yourself included, are, are, are speaking out about the way that stigma will militate against the development of effective supports. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you've been, I think you were instrumental in the Office of National Drug Control Policy Summit in 2013, where the Obama administration decided to end the inherited war on drugs and begin a public education campaign around addiction as a disease. So, I mean, you've, you've been so instrumental in so many ways. How, how do you see the priorities moving forward? How do we get to the, and believe me, Vermont, where I am is a great example. We've done wonders in Vermont. We have recovery centers all over the place, recovery coaches, low excess buprenorphine, harm reduction. I mean, we're, 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 we're moving forward here. But, 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 
Vermont, I think, is a little bit of an exception. How do you how do you see priorities moving forward? How do we push this forward? Hmm. Well, it takes will and and um, and you know, kind of insight uh, into the nature um, of these problems and what works and what doesn't, and a willingness to admit when we've made wrong turns. Hmm. Um, and now, nationally, as you pointed out, that was done, formally done, back in 2013 on December 9th. I was very fortunate to be there at that White House summit. Mm. It was the first ever National Drug Policy Reform Summit held since the declaration of the war on drugs. And it marked a formal shift at the federal level away from the war on drugs, as you pointed out, Ed, towards a broader public health approach to these endemic problems. And um, I felt, and I think many people felt that was good news because it was an acknowledgement at the federal level um, at this shift towards this very important shift towards uh, public health approaches to help people um, who suffer from these problems. Number one, to prevent them ideally. Number two, to intervene early. Number three, to provide proper treatment and recovery supports for those who are uh, severely um, addicted um, so that they can um, uh, find recovery. Um, now, I think, you know, what's happened now is a greater recognition of what we have learned about the nature of these disorders. And this, of course, pertains to the things that we've been talking about today, the cause and controllability factors involved with substance use disorder. We did not know this 50 years ago. We did not know about the genetic contribution and the degree of contribution of genetics to the onset of, of addiction, nor did we know about the nature. We knew that people had impaired control. We didn't, understand, we didn't understand exactly why that was. We understand much more clearly, number one, what the nature of that damage is in the brain, and also the factors that you pointed out, uh, which can help people recover. Mm. We think about you know, the environmental conditions um, that we need to provide and create that really facilitates healing uh, in the brain and recalibration, readaptation in the absence of the substances so that people can get well and their brain and their, uh, their um, central nervous system can, can get well. Now, what we're seeing now, of course, under the new administration, both with the Obama administration and now with the, to some extent, under the Trump administration, but this has been really ramped up with the new Biden administration in terms of providing um, uh, much more funding, particularly in light of the opioid crisis, which has been an absolute necessity and and obviously a, 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 a horrible crisis that we're still dealing with. Um, but the appropriation of funding, you know, has been fantastic in the sense that, you know, billions and billions of dollars now have been dedicated to providing access to, to harm reduction services, to buprenorphine, to Narcan, uh, to uh, needle exchanges, to other kinds of harm reduction so that we can keep people alive long enough that we can help them into remission and recovery and a better quality of life. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, there's a new bill now in Congress to provide for, by law, for uh, additional recovery support services. And these are the kind of things that we don't normally think about when we think about treatment. These are things like housing, jobs, um, the social support, the things that uh, job training, education, the traction, the recovery capital, as we call it, the things that can instill hope for people that they can lead a better life, they can get back into, into life and make a new start in life. Those things now NIDA recognizes as essential components of comprehensive drug treatment. Nice. For about 30 years, that was not on the landscape, that was not on the radar. So we've come a long way in recognizing not just to address clinical pathology, but the, what the so-called social determinants of health as well, which can augment healing. <clears throat> Beautiful. Yes, yes. And um, I couldn't be more encouraged. I've been in the field for a while. I am a person in recovery. So I've studied this from many, many different aspects. And, and I couldn't agree more uh, with you that there is something changing in America. It seems, um, I like to call it a sea change, uh, but, but you could call it the beginning like or a tipping point it seems that efforts like yours and, 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 and many others throughout the decades 
have really taken hold and America is beginning to understand what's happening with people with addiction. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly in my state, I, I, I see it every day. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when you talk about um, cause and, and controllability, I, I, I think that it becomes most um, tragic and most clear when we look at <clears throat> overdose fatality in America, that I, I, I believe at the um, 12 month period ending April, 2021, the number now is 100,000, 64% um, or 64,000 of those 100 are opioid and the rest I think are, are stimulants. So that means there's, there's, there's tragic things happening in the country today. Now, <clears throat> I, I, I mean, I think the World Health Organization did a study where they ranked the severity of stigma and what they termed addicts were, 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 were most stigmatized against. Uh, alcoholics were the term they used, I think were number four. And, and that's been my observation. <clears throat> when, when, when the word addict is used, uh, it's associated with a person who injects drugs. And, and I think that people who inject drugs, doctor, if there were a totem of stigma, they would be the lowest on the totem. And I, and I think I see that reflected in movement in our country toward what's called overdose prevention sites. The New York Times uh, today, this morning, New York Times uh, has an article, there have been two overdose prevention sites open now in, in uh, New York, one in East Harlem, one in Washington Heights. Um, there are uh, two, I think, pilot programs slated to begin in Rhode Island in March of 2022. So there's a big, there's, now there's a real beginning in America. But I'd like your opinion on that. You know, do you, do you think that <clears throat> stigma is playing a role in, in America's hesitancy to implement something that's uh, proven uh, worldwide to be uh, effective with this particular population, the population that's dying. Absolutely, you know, it, it, it's stigma. And, and what, 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 what I think the stigma does is that it prevents a proper analysis of the data and, 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 and what these things can do for people who suffer from these disorders and conditions. Um, so it prevents people, the stigma and discrimination, it means people look the other way. They don't even take a look at the data and why these things are effective and why they're helpful for people. Um, so I think that's the effect of stigma is that it leads you know, policymakers away from um, looking at how these can help. Because at first glance, just the same with needle exchanges, um, people thought, well, that's just going to increase um, um, uh, uh, drug use. It's going to attract people to drug use if you provide needle exchanges or reduce harm. Uh, you'll increase young people's involvement with drugs if you decrease uh, harm or have a safe place where people can go and inject drugs and prevent overdose. Um, in fact, the opposite is true. Um, uh, so it's, um, it, it's contrary to what one might think off the bat without taking uh, stock of the nature of these problems and how these things can help. That's where stigma, I think, uh, uh, blocks people. Um, and these things are absolutely crucial. This whole you know, cadre of um, harm reduction uh, uh, services are critical from overdose prevention sites, as you said, Ed, which are emerging and growing. Um, that can prevent overdose and spread of infectious disease and expose people to other people uh, where they can get information about treatment and treatment services if they want to take advantage of those. Um, so that engages people more uh, when you have a compassionate stance um, towards people who suffer from these conditions. Again, Narcan, uh, needle exchanges, all these things um, have been shown to reduce overdose deaths Imagine if it was your dad or your mom, or your sister, or your wife or your husband or your kid yeah. who was suffering from this and they died. Yeah. And 
if you could, you would do anything to bring them back. And if yeah. that meant a safe place that they could go and under supervision inject drugs, but stay alive, give, live, live, live to another day where they could actually have a chance at recovery, a chance at remission, um, anybody would take that. Anybody yes. would take that. Yes, yes, well, so well put, so eloquently and, and compassionately uh, put. And that really is the case. It is, you know, my mother and my father and my sister and my brother and my son, my uncle, my boss. You know, it's it's hitting everybody now. And that's, I think, why, you know, we're beginning to tip in the right direction, because there is no one. You, you could say, let me see a show of hands. How many people have been affected by the opioid uh, overdose crisis? And there'll be many, many hands that will, will go up. I was at a, um, a recent demonstration in Burlington where a group of parents who had lost children to, to, to overdose fatality, had uh, they had pictures uh, lining the entire park, lining the, the entire park. And as you, as you walked around the park, seeing these kids, mostly young people, some middle-aged, some older, but mostly between 20 and 35 years old. If you, as you saw their pictures, your heart, you couldn't help but, but feel um, empathy for them and, and for their parents. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's you know, growing considerably in our country is, is empathy for this particular uh, population. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's right. And you know, sadly, that's that's the case that so many families have, uh, have been touched by the crisis and not just the opioid crisis, but the alcohol crisis, mm -hmm. which of course is uh, all has been with us and remains with us. And which is also, as you pointed out, heavily stigmatized and um, underreported. Now we have reports of 100,000 deaths per year from alcohol, but it's more like actually 600,000. Uh, estimates place it more like at 600,000 because um, it's radically underreported. People, family members don't want alcoholism on the death certificate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, often, and I've seen this done myself, uh, where the clear cause of death has been alcohol addiction, but uh, nobody wants to put that on the, anywhere on the record. Yeah. And so it's not documented. And again, it's because of stigma and fear of discrimination. That, that's one of the things that's really changed in Vermont. We've had a number of families, three or four families that have publicized their children's death being a result of a drug overdose. Mm -hmm. And it's really caused you know, so much of a, an enlivened support to uh, become uh, a, you know, present in the community. We have entire communities rallying around these families. Mm -hmm. But let's take alcohol. Uh, let's switch gears here. And thank you so much for your views on, on um overdose prevention sites it's controversial and i was i was looking forward to hearing you know you know what where your present thinking was so thank you doctor i want to move now um i want to take a look at the cochrane study i'm gonna i'll read you uh your quote from an interview in alcoholics anonymous uh box 459 the, the aa uh, periodical this is from the fall edition <clears throat> You say, quote, <clears throat> what our research shows is that when you subject AA to the same scientific standards as any other type of intervention, it is at least as good as or often better and certainly cheaper than anything else. When you're talking about a disease that kills 3.3 million people around the world, this is something you have to pay attention to. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about this study. What did you find? I think it's fascinating. Yeah, well, this was this was what what's called a, you know is a systematic review of all of the science, the rigorous science conducted on Alcoholics Anonymous and twelve step so called twelve step treatment or twelve step facilitation treatments, which are clinically delivered treatments, which link patients who have a severe alcohol use disorder with AA. So they're kind of a strategy, a clinical linkage strategy or some kind of psychotherapy that is 12-step based that links patients to these free, ubiquitous, indigenous community resources. And what we found when we looked at all the most rigorous uh, studies that have been done in the last 35 years, um, there were 27 of them that were included, 
27, these were mostly randomized studies. So true experiments where patients were randomized either to receive a linkage to Alcoholics Anonymous or receive some kind of other treatment like cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, most commonly that was the case. And then they were followed up for varying lengths of time up to three years after the intervention. And as you alluded to, what we found, which was quite surprising, was that a simple linkage to AA produced as good in most instances or better when it came to long-term remission, uh, better rates of recovery for those patients who were randomly assigned to the 12-step condition and the linkage to AA at a reduced healthcare cost of about $10,000 per patient per year. So that's good news. When we think about a very high volume, high burden disease like alcohol addiction, alcohol use disorder, that we can link to this free ubiquitous community support service, in this case, Alcoholics Anonymous, and produce as good or better outcomes at a lower cost. That's what we're looking for all across healthcare. And um, that's what we found in that study. That's that's just that's just beautiful, and um, I, I I would like to help to to publicize that. And that's why I'm bringing it up on the show, and I'm so happy that I have you here to to elaborate a little on it. You know, I'd like you to to l let's dig into that a little bit because you know, in 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 my view, as an observer. Um, if there's any place in the world that is close to stigma free, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, in Alcoholics Anonymous, part of the AA preamble and the AA tradition is the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. So not only does the person, is the person not stigmatized against for having an alcohol use disorder, but it's required to be a member. Mm -hmm. So there's a value, which is kind of the opposite of a stigma mm -hmm. placed on people with alcohol use disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a fellowship being paramount, mm -hmm. you know, of unity being paramount, people are there for each other. It just mm -hmm. seems to me, um, Although they do use, you know, they will say alcoholic. They don't say I'm a person with an alcohol use disorder. But 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 it seems to me, you know, on, on the deepest level where stigma resides, that Alcoholics Anonymous is very close to being stigma free. What do you what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting. I've never heard quite put it like that. And it's an interesting take on it. I, I agree with you in the sense that yes. What it does, it provides a destigmatization because when people are suffering from these very stigmatized conditions, when they find themselves in a situation with other people who are in the same boat, they're literally in the same boat, they've suffered the same kinds of problems, then that is immense relief and liberation. That sense of commonality and common suffering, the, what, they, what Yalom calls, um, Yalom is a group therapy theorist, he calls universality. The idea that you've got this universal, um, uh, you know, problem that you've had, and also the installation of hope that you can see other people, you've got visible role models right in front of you, where you can see that recovery is possible, and they can show you how to do it. And there's multiple pathways within AA, of course, to recovery that people have walked, and so there's a variety of different recovery experiences that people can pick up on and follow. And that is immensely liberating. On the flip side, the flip side though, I would say that it's anonymous. <laughs> so there's a reason why it's Alcoholics Anonymous, of course, is because now there is a kind of a spirituality, kind of humility aspect to that, but also it's also because of the stigma. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why that was anonymous back in the day we started and it's still right with us, yeah. you know, because we're having this conversation. Now we've made a lot of progress, as you said, Ed. We've made a lot of progress. We have made progress. And it's good to take note of that. Look to see where we've made progress. 
and then what we need to do to continue to keep our foot on the gas here. But um, there's a reason also why still today there's that need for anonymity and confidentiality because there is, whether we like it or not, um, there can be negative ramifications um, for having one of these disorders. Now we are, of course, having this conversation with the aim of trying to change that, um, but that, that is a fact. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, I've been in this field for a long time and um, uh, everyone who knows me knows I'm in recovery. But up until, up until this year, I've allowed people to think whatever they want to think about what I'm in recovery from. But I see purpose now in revealing uh, that I am in, in recovery from in, injection drug use. And I, I was unaware of it up until very recently. But what has made me reluctant to be explicit about that has been stigma. And now I find um, purpose, real purpose in revealing it. So I will reveal it. And um, because I think it can help push forward a little bit for people to see who I am right. and what I'm in recovery from. But it can be very frightening. You know, you can, you, you feel you have a secret and you're gonna be punished about it. There's no reason uh, to reveal it. Yes. So I, I, I mean, I want to, um, I just, in closing, I know we have to close now. You, there's been talk about, you know, educating people about stigma, educating people about language, educating people about the dynamics of, of brain disease. And, I, and, I, and I, I think it's absolutely crucial. But there's been talk of the real test being exposing people to people you know who use drugs exposing people to people who are in recovery from using drugs and having those personal relationships this is really the way forward really the way to change the nature of what's happening in america how do we have uh, faces and voices of recovery we have uh, like a lot of publicity what's your feeling about about that that next step where, where not only do we kind of intellectually understand, but we kind of feel inside a relative comfort with someone who is in recovery or someone who has a substance use disorder. <clears throat> yeah, and you touched on it uh, beautifully in my mind, you know, the, the, the stereotypes, and this is, right, this is true right across um, prejudice and stereotype research, um, uh, which affects many as aspects of society, of course. Um, but exposure to people who have the condition disabuses people, dismantles those stereotypes that people have. Now, the danger is, um, and this is a known thing in prejudice research, is, is exceptionalism, where people will say, well, Ed, yeah, Ed's in recovery, but he's an exception. Mm. Ed's a, Ed's, a, Ed's a smart, articulate gentleman. Um, he was once uh, addicted an IV drug user, but look at him now, but he's an exception. Mm. So you can see th this is where the, the bias, the, the cognitive uh, stereotype and the bias, people get around it by saying, they're still, they still hold the prejudice because Ed's an exception. Now, here's the difference though. When enough people, begin to talk about it, come out and start to talk about it, then you can't, it, it further dismantles the stereotype where people can't just say, well, that's an exception. Well, can all these people be exceptions? Mm -hmm. um, and so more and more people now, and I'm pleased to see at the federal level, the support for employing people in the federal government who are in recovery. Yeah. What a yeah. great thing that is. You can see it with Marty Walsh, who's now become the uh, Secretary for Labor, um, a man openly in recovery for many decades. Um, and many people, the Biden administration is actually making a point of um, employing people because they're in recovery almost, <laughs> because they want to they send the message that we value people in recovery and that people in recovery are valuable people as well. And so... That's been, a, I think, a very important and nice step this administration 
And it's things like that, isn't it, that, that can make a difference and help the nation uh, to change their mind. Oh, it really is. That, that's so, thank you for sharing that. That's so um, in, in encouraging, encouraging to me. What, what, a, a, what a great uh, time to, to be alive, uh, to be in this field. You know, there's so much energy. Uh, we, I think we all feel more energized than ever before. People ask me, Ed, you know, when are you going to retire? It's impossible to retire. How could you possibly retire now? It's the wrong time to retire. <laughs> well, let me let me just express my, my my heartfelt thanks again, Dr. Kelly. Thank you so much. Oh yeah. Oh well, Ed. No, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. Hopefully, this was helpful. Um, and um, you know, if anybody has any questions, or wants further information about, or any any of the articles that I've talked about. Um, they can always email email me at at, um, at MGH. At, if you just look up my name, uh, John Kelly Harvard, you'll find my page, and you can you can find my email there. We'll we'll um we'll we'll make a page, and we'll, we'll okay. come at the end yeah. of the show for sure. Thank you so much for being available, Doctor. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, Ed. Okay, take care. Okay, bye bye. Yeah.